And they're meeting like. Yes. Yeah. But okay. All right, we start again. Okay, <laughs> starting again. Interview number two. Interview wrap two. Here we go. No, it's number one. How does it look? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> No, I can't remember. What did I did I did, did you ask me a question? I just rambled about my life. Yeah. Ramble? Yeah, yesterday it was perfect. So. Was it? Yeah, it was. So when did you start your business? Um, uh, Lucky's is uh, about eight years old now. Um, I originally, this was a coffee house in what used to be a not great part of town um, and it was a struggling business but when I moved back to Cleveland because I'm from Cleveland um, I didn't have a lot of money and uh, the owner of this business uh, rented me what was a storage closet for a hundred dollars a month to do my baking business and that's what I could afford. <laughs> Thanks sweetie. Um, a yeah, perfect price, uh, but literally it was a table and think sinks and you know teeny little space. And I baked um, baked things for here, and then for farmers markets and some restaurants. And I I, I started off really small because a I didn't have a lot of money, um, but also um, I didn't know if Clevelanders would understand the the difference between using you know whole butter and milk and the fact that it costs more money. So it was a risk. And um, every time the business here was having a problem and they were struggling is they would ask my opinion because I had owned a business in Seattle and I owned a business in upstate New York and um, so they would ask my opinion and when I would help them um, finally the you know we started getting written up in newspapers and and being on TV for what I was doing so we started getting busier and the owner came to me one day and said you know do you want to be my partner and you know I didn't have to pay anything to become a partner I just had to do all the work you know sure um, that sounds good and when I started looking at the financials I knew that as a coffee house we would not make it because it's not corporate coffee um, and so that's when I decided that we needed to cook food and that on the weekends when people come here and buy a cup of coffee for three dollars and sit here for three hours like meeting with people I just needed them to eat something while they were here and I and I needed to take the time to get them to understand that we would make things from scratch and it was going to be a good product so um, initially I started cooking on camping burners um, and you know because we didn't have the money to buy a stove or the room to buy a stove and I thought if we could do you know 30 to 40 brunches every Saturday and Sunday then we could dig the business out of needing to, to close down um, but we cooked on camping burners for three summers and built it to the point where we were doing about 225 to 250 brunches every Saturday and Sunday and we were being written up about and we were on TV and the whole thing um, and when food writers would want to or students or whomever wanted to come and meet me or come in the kitchen they would come back there and they would be like uh, where do you cook like what do you where okay um, that's when we finally went to a bank and said you know people are coming they understand what we're all about um, if we had a kitchen we could do more and a bank decided to take a risk on you know on me and we built the kitchen but literally the first summer that we had the kitchen we'd already outgrown it I mean you know we're like little sardines back there um, <clears throat> Uh, originally the lot over here was a vacant lot that people would throw garbage on and I would mow it and take care of it and but it wasn't our property um, you know and I had a couple of farmers in downtown Cleveland that would grow food for me um, I would talk to them about what I wanted them to grow for me and it was one winter day where I was walking by the sidewalk and talking to one of my staff about you know snow removal or something and it dawned on me it's like well, uh, we could be growing food right here so at that point we started um, you know researching 
how we could get that property and and very quickly from the help of community and other farmers and council people um, we purchased the property and we registered it as national farmland mm -hmm. so it can never be built on ever like they can't somebody can't come in and like say I want to put a house there it's always going to be protected um, which is really great and um, how is the soil it's actually toxic um, because in this neighborhood um, originally this neighborhood was all immigrant workers who worked in the steel mills um, it's like this whole little Tumon is basically almost like an island surrounded all the way you know 75 percent by industry and highways love you um, <clears throat> And so the soil has, oh my god, really? Uh, hey, Christopher? <laughs> okay, Zippy. Um, so, you know, by generations of uh, toxic, you know, air, the soil, and like the, all the fall that happens from producing steel, um, it's not good to grow in the soil. But we, that's why we decided on the, um, the raised beds. And even the parts of the property that we grow in soil, we've amended it over years by adding compost and adding a bunch of stuff that will make it okay to plant in. Um, but it, it was a process. I mean, like even building the raised beds, we had, you know, a miller donate the wood for the beds, and we—it was really—it was like a, a community of people coming together because we wanted to employ at-risk young people from this neighborhood. So the first five years of its existence, we would raise money all year round, and then we would work with the public school system in this neighborhood to find, you know, three or four young people who were most at risk and most in need of mentoring from mm -hmm. somebody. And, uh, you know, and they would, we, ba we basically paid them a stipend to work on what we consider our farm for the summer. And um, the most rewarding part of that is that, you know, these young people start off at the beginning of the summer really angry that they have to work and angry that they have to get their hands in dirt and, you know, I mean, what a waste of time. And they spend half their time on the cell phone, you know, the whole thing. Um, but it's great because by the end of the summer, they're, they're so in love with what they're doing. Um, and they're getting other young people involved in, like, next year you can do it and giving speeches at City Hall and, and uh, you know, there's nothing better than that. Really. Yeah, this is great. Yep. Um, yeah, back to, to the garden. Yes. Uh, what is the relationship between your kitchen and the garden? Oh, what, oh boy. You know, when I, when, I, um, when I interview somebody who wants to work, it's a learning kitchen. So other than the management, myself and my chef de cuisine and my sous chef, um, my pastry chef, all the other staff are young people or, or people who have never been given a chance to cook because they didn't have ex any experience or students or people who want to be students. So they make really crappy money. Um, but they're exposed to, you know, all these, you know, professional people like myself who've been cooking all of our lives and we show them everything. We're very generous with what we know and so it's important to me right when they start I'll start off by showing them a farm fresh egg next to a commercial egg and we do use some mass produced eggs mm -hmm. but they're still farm fresh eggs like they're not mass produced eggs it's kind of like here's the perfect egg here's mm -hmm. good eggs and here's, well, don't even go near that egg, right? So we, for like things like cookies where we would have to sell cookies for $5 a piece, we use these eggs. And then for eggs where it's like you have an omelet, we use these eggs. So, um, you know, right from the beginning, I'll show them the difference, you know. And anytime something comes into season, when I come back from the farmer's market or when we pick stuff out of the garden, I have them all participate and I'll have them, you know, try it fresh out of the garden. Like they've never had something like that, you know. Um, there's been such a, a lack of link to the tradition of cooking and the fact that 
cooking real food takes time that you know the generation of young people who are coming into their own now as chefs um, la they lack that tradition probably in their home so now they're being exposed to foods that I know I grew up on but they've never had a Brussels sprout or you know a fresh green bean out of the garden you don't have to cook it dude just you know just eat it like it's delicious you know um, so I see them just so excited because they as part of what they do every single day during the, the harvest time is they part of their day is going out and like picking lettuce and picking tomatoes and you know picking the green beans and the cucumbers and that's part of their prep you know which is really exciting and, and I don't know of many kitchens in Cleveland where that's part of their day you know um, and I hope with the when we're building our second our third restaurant um, my goal is to take a vacant lot um, downtown and, and actually, you know, have like a bigger property and do raised beds and a straw bale house so that somebody every summer can live there and actually take care of our farm. And then all the, the, the we're going to have chickens and all the produce will actually go into the three restaurants now. So. Um, how is your harvest? Do the people that come here see you? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think, you know, for us, um, like, it, like, like I was the saying, um, you know, this year's the first year we're going to do potatoes, you know, like, and you can grow potatoes in, uh, in tires, um, and, you know, so tires are not going into landfills, they're being used for it, and instead of having potatoes grow like this, they're, you know, they're growing like this. So something like the potatoes, I mean, customers probably have never even seen that. So then it's a good way to show a customer with not very much space, you can grow food. Um, and, you know, like we let the customers walk around the garden and, and we let people pick things and eat them, um, which is really exciting because, you know, young kids will see like a little cherry tomato and, and you get them to try it because it's teeny and it's, you know, not too much of a commitment. And now they taste it and it's like candy, you know, now they... <laughs> They'd say, oh, I don't hate tomatoes. You know, they thought they hated tomatoes. Um, so really, as far as the property on location, it's not, we don't grow enough of anything. Um, but as in that customers see, like, how an eggplant is grown, and they know that we make ratatouille out of that, and they, you know, they see the tomatoes, and they know that in, you know, the, and the, the basil, we make pesto, and people, you know, they get excited because they see us out there working in it, and it gives them a connection to the food. Yeah, it's not just about food. Exactly. Like, the, you know, customers ask all the time, like, I'll be out there. I mean, my favorite thing is after a really busy Saturday or Sunday brunch, I will go out in the garden, I'll work in the garden just to decompress, you know, and um, customers all the time come out and say, well, what is this and what is this? And even the easiest thing, like parsley, somebody will look at it and say, well, what is that? And it's like, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> Personally, um, but they just don't, you know, I mean, for a lot of people, they think, you know, they, their connection to food is it's in plastic on styrofoam wrapped up in the grocery store, and that's how it comes, right? Where, no, you can actually pick it out of the garden. And okay, good. it's perfect. Yes. Good? Yeah. All right. We love you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I, well, I hope I covered all the bases. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry you had to wait on me. But no, no, it's our fault it's our because fault. We have to do it, it was twice. not good, the, the volume Just yesterday, the, so... Like oh, good. <laughs> what, what did, is this a new one? Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you like it? Yeah, it's okay. I have it's one good. that I call my brain, so it's like in the middle of things, you know, this whole thing. And I keep looking at new ones and I'm like, I'm still not completely, so I'm that person who looks at like,